Well, good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you so much for taking some time to be here with us today. And thank you so much for joining our briefing on understanding the unintended consequences of the Break Free from Plastics Pollution Act. Um, I wanna start off by um, going over a few logistics. Um, we will have a, a panel of speakers today who will give some you know, remarks and some insights on various components of the legislation. But most importantly, this is a dialogue for us to have a conversation. Um, we will have a Q&A portion of the briefing, uh, and we invite you to uh, add your question in the queue uh, by clicking on the Q&A button at the bottom of the webinar. Uh, we will process those, we will answer those um, as they come in, and we might even call on some of you and unmute you um, to make clear some of those questions. Um, I wanna kick off today's webinar um, and I said, you know, just again, thank everybody so much for joining. Uh, I'm Joshua Baca, and I am the Vice President of the Plastics Division at the American Chemistry Council. Uh, the goal of today's briefing is to continue our efforts to educate stakeholders on the troubling provisions that are found in the Break Free from Plastics Pollution Act and similar provisions that are found in Title IX of the Clean Future Act. As I mentioned, we've organized an all-star panel of subject matter experts who will detail today the widespread paralysis the proposed legislation will have on three really critical components. One, the impact it will have on addressing plastic waste in the environment. Two, the impact it will have on our combined efforts to combat climate change. And three, what the legislation will do, the proposed legislation will do in disrupting resilient supply chains all across America. Um, before we get into the substance of today's briefing, I wanna be really clear about something that's very important. Um, we're not just here to say no to this legislation. In fact, all of us on this call, our industry, our partners, our members, you can count us to roll up our sleeves and collaborate on realistic and practical solutions that can be implemented. In fact, we've set some pretty ambitious goals, some that you'll hear today, commitments put forth by our industry and by our partners. And the reality of it is, is if we are going to meet these commitments and these goals, we're gonna need the partnership and the help from Congress. Um, I talk a little bit about our members. Let me just give you a quick overview of who our members are. Um, some of them you'll hear from today. Um, our members are the leading producers of modern plastic materials used to make countless consumer and durable goods. Um, they're responsible uh, for key innovations that have improved the quality of our lives, our environment, and the economy. And I think all of us here today, all of us want a clean environment. Some of us on this call are parents. All of us care about the communities we live in. And that's why we have a forward-looking vision to protect it for generations to come. Our vision is guided by our circularity roadmap that outlines a bold plan that we are currently executing on through four components, public policy, industry investments, some of those that you'll hear about today, collaboration and partnership, and most importantly, innovation. If we move to the next slide here, um, I wanna just talk about how we're implementing this plan, both with our members and with key partners across the value chain, uh, to address both climate change and plastic waste in the environment. And I wanna outline four key things that we are for. We are for a shared responsibility model that levels fees on packaging and uses that funding to um, uh, invest in more recycling infrastructure and educate consumers on the best way to recycle. We are for the acceleration of advanced recycling to revolutionize how we use and reuse our plastic resources. We are for and are working with brands and customers all across the country to use more recycled and circular plastic content based on science and engineering and more of our products to ensure most importantly that more used plastic is remade into new products. And frankly, we are for a national recycling strategy to support the standardization of recycling, improve access for Americans all across the country. This is a comprehensive bipartisan and innovative strategy that's focused on driving sustainable change, fighting climate change, and reducing plastic waste in the environment. And most importantly, it lives up to the commitment put forth by President Biden to protect and build America's supply chains. Um, unfortunately, for us, this legislation is a non-starter. And the efforts in this legislation would put a pause, the provision in this legislation would put a pause on many of these efforts that I just walked through to today. Outside organizations who support this legislation will claim that the intent is to end plastic waste. 
I've made it very clear that's something that we share in and we believe in that vision as well. And plastic or frankly, any other material in the environment is never acceptable. And after a careful analysis of the legislation, some of that which we'll go over today, we have concluded it won't end plastic waste, but rather it will end the production of modern and innovative plastic materials by implementing rules and regulations that could never realistically be achieved. Domestic supply chains would be disruptive. Businesses would have to search for less effective alternatives, some which may not be available at all. Burdensome new regulations, as I mentioned, would be imposed uh, on already struggling industries, some that may not be in achievable. Uh, and advanced recycling technology is the most effective tool that we have at our disposal to eliminate plastic waste uh, would be rendered useless right now. Ultimately for us, problems with this legislation include that it picks winners and losers. On the next slide, this is a really key important point here for us. It incentivizes materials that produce significantly more greenhouse gas emissions, which is counter to the goals of many in Congress and counter to the goals put forth by the Biden administration. It limits products that are essential to combating climate change, including electric car vehicles, as you'll see on the next slide, also solar panels and wind turbines. And if passed into law, this legislation will risk a shortage of critical items at a time that we could least afford to take a chance, ranging from masks to gowns, face shields to syringes, and specialized packaging for vaccines. Ultimately, this will undermine the global economic and health response to COVID-19. Uh, today's panel is going to dive into all of what I just talked about in greater detail. And as I said, let me be the first to acknowledge, we have more work to do to end plastic waste in the environment, but this is a solvable problem and one that we are committed to. With that, I wanna to introduce today's panel uh, we have some really special guests with us today, uh, partners and outside experts that we work with on a daily basis. Um, Derek McDonald is a partner uh, of environmental practice at the law firm Baker Botts. We've been working closely with Derek and his team to better understand the practical implications of this legislation. Stephanie Daigle uh, is the vice president of government affairs at the Salonese Corporation. She's gonna talk a little bit about how some of these provisions would impact her company and many of their operations. Laura Chamorro is the general manager of Shell Polymers. She's gonna talk about some of the work that they're already doing uh, in advanced recycling uh, and some of the facilities and programs that they're currently building across the country. Uh, we also have Haley Lowry. Uh, she is the global sustainability director at Dow. And she's going to talk about how many of the provisions of this legislation would actually undermine the intent of dealing with issues of plastic waste and climate change. And finally, uh, we got Michael Moreno. He's the chief operating officer at Braven Environmental. Michael is a great partner for us. He's an entrepreneur. Uh, and he's going to talk in great detail about some of the work that Braven is doing um, to bring a lot of these technologies in advanced recycling to life. Um, so with that, um, I want to thank everybody again for being here. I'm going to go ahead and hand over to the nuts and bolts of the panel. Derek, I'm going to turn it over to you and to Stephanie to kind of bring this uh, to life. Hello, everyone. It's, it's good to meet everybody virtually this morning. As, as Joshua mentioned, my name is Derek McDonald, and I'm a partner in the environmental law practice at Baker Botts. Uh, for over 25 years, I've worked on permitting major energy and manufacturing facilities under the Clean Air Act in Texas and other states. And I also regularly teach the Environmental Law Institute's Clean Air Act course for new lawyers at their annual boot camps. Uh, thank you so much for the opportunity to share my thoughts on the far-reaching Clean Air Act implications of the language contained in Section 4 of the Break Free from Plastics Act. As Joshua mentioned, similar language is also found on in Title IX of the Clean Future Act. Uh, I'll cover two main points areas in my remarks. First is the wide range of air permits that Break Free could affect. And second is how the temporary pause would impact manufacturing operations that require those permits. Um, as a primer, the Clean Air Act regulates in one way or another every source of gases or vapors emitted at manufacturing facilities. The Act requires issuance of two types of permits to operate a plant. The first is a case-by-case pre-construction permit that is required before a plant can even start construction of a project. And the second is an operating permit that ensures the safe and compliant plant operations by collecting all permit and regulatory requirements in one document that enhance federal, state, and public oversight of operations. Many owners, operators, plants, and processes can be covered by a single air permit, 
but most plants also have dozens of air permits that regulate their operations. Uh, air permits are issued by EPA or by state or local agencies where authority has been delegated or approved by EPA, and each case subject to EPA's oversight if the state or local is a permitting uh, lead. The proposed changes in law by break free go right to the heart of the state, local, and federal interplay on these permits. There's a common misconception, I think it's reflected in the, in the proposed language, that air permits are only required for brand new, just being built plants. That's absolutely not true. Um, existing plants regularly require new permits too. Nearly every change at a plant that affects the quantity or character of air emissions can require both a new pre-construction air permit and a new form of operating permit. This is true even for changes that sig significantly improve the safety of the operation, uh, increase a plant's reliability or efficiency, and or in, in enhance a plant's uh, pollution control and abatement performance. You know, air permits are key to everything. Now let's talk a little bit about how the temporary pause would affect all these permits and operations at plants. The language in section four is intended to prevent new permits from being approved during the permit moratorium while new rules are being developed. This would be required even though air permits are designed to ensure consistency with applicable health and safety standards. And many of these same standards are followed by industries other than the plastic manufacturers in addition to the plastic manufacturers. It's unclear why break free would pause plastic plant permits, but other industries are allowed to adhere to the same governmental standards that have been found to be protected. Um, to lift the pause, because it's temporary, according to the language, EPA must start and finish 10 rulemaking processes, many of which contain policy and technical issues of first impression. I want it to be clear, just because break free and the legislation sets a three-year deadline to complete the regulations doesn't mean that that deadline can or will be met. Based on my 25 years of practice um, participating in Clean Air Act regulatory development over multiple administrations, uh, the 10 air-related rulemakings required by break free are just not likely to be concluded in three years. It's too much, it's too fast. These actions all include um, a range of new source performance standards. And these are standards that apply to new and modified existing sources to ensure covered facilities use only zero emissions energy sources. It's required um, for a new NSPS to designate plastic facilities as a new stationary source category so that a new and different NSPS can be established for that category. It's going to require enhanced vessel storage, flaring, equipment leak, natural gas, um, boiler, and monitoring rules to be developed. It's going to in require enhanced control of benzene uh, equipment links and waste operations and new hazardous air pollutant rules. It's going to require new maximum achievable control standards um, for hazardous air pollutants from covered facilities to be established. And it's also going to uh, require a comprehensive environmental justice uh, air permitting rule to be developed. And, and to be clear, this is only on the air side. I'm not speaking about the Clean Water Act implications, but Break Free also requires numerous Clean Water Act rulemakings to be completed as well and during this time period. And how will the temporary pause work? While EPA is writing these regulations, the intent of the drafters is clear. Uh, the temporary pause uh, provision is intended to prevent the issuance of new permits and require that EPA object to permit actions where state and local agencies act as the lead permitting authority. These objections will likely prevent new projects, including beneficial changes of the sort Joshua mentioned to existing plants from being developed. But the bottom line is break freeze approach will result in widespread permitting paralysis for at least three years and quite likely much longer than that, affecting the many beneficial projects that are manufactured by this sec sector and, and really rippling across our economy. The state local federal permitting relationship that's so important under the Clean Air Act will be fully disrupted. And, and really any suggestion that the permitting implications are narrow or that the pause will not be severely disruptive, I can assure you is misguided. Uh, I'm happy to 
uh, answer any questions that you have um, and uh, turn it over to Stephanie now. Thank you, Derek. I appreciate that. My name is Stephanie Daigle, and I'm Vice President of Government Affairs at Selenese Corporation. Selenese is a specialty chemical and engineered materials company that was started in the U.S. more than 100 years ago. Our headquarters is located in Irving, Texas. And we have 7,600 employees worldwide, with 2,500 of them located in the U.S. Our engineered materials are used in most major industries, including auto, medical, and building and construction. Although break free from plastic and Title IX of the Clean Futures Act is intended as a waste reduction uh, provision, the implications go well beyond that and it will significantly curtail the chemical industry in the United States. That will have significant economic impact. The chemical sector supports 544,000 jobs in the US and 25% of our US GDP is thanks to the chemical industry. More than 94% of all manufactured goods in the US are directly touched on by chemistry. The chemistry sector has significant impact in the US. Derek explained to you the impact on the pause on the chemical sector as a whole. I'd like to talk a little bit about what impact would it have on an average chemical facility in the US. As I mentioned earlier, Selenese polymers are used in the production of durable goods that impact people's lives every day. From the little red button on your seatbelt to the center console of the car, to the casing and separators in the battery of electric vehicles. Our materials make cars safer and they make them more energy efficient. You'll also find our materials in vital medical products, such as the tip of your COVID test kit or inhalers for asthma treatment. You'll also find them in continuous glucose monitors so that people can manage their diabetes more effectively. You'll also see it in orthopedic implants, knees and hips. Many people don't realize, but those are made of polymers. There are literally entire industries that rely on our products to survive. Our ability to manufacture these products in the United States will be significantly curtailed if this pause was to go into effect. Out of our 10 operating facilities in the US, seven are gonna be directly impacted. The remaining three are gonna be indirectly impacted because they rely on raw materials from the uh, seven that are directly impacted. As Derek explained, this legislation would prohibit covered facilities from attaining new Clean Air Act permits for our existing facilities. If we don't have a permit, we can't proceed with our products and we can't operate. Let me give you a few examples. We recently received a permit at one of our facilities to eliminate CO2 venting. This is a great project. It's environmentally beneficial. But if the pause was in effect, EPA would have to say no, prohibiting this project from going forward. Also, as required by law, we have to update our air permits on a regular basis. And if these permits occur during the pause, they're not gonna be updated and our, and our projects will cease to occur. Finally, we're also expanding a lot of our facilities due to increased demand in products, especially in the area of medical, auto, and infrastructure. All of us have heard about how important it is to expand our 5G infrastructure that's heavily reliant on polymers. If we can't meet the demand in the US, we're going to have to go elsewhere. Let me be very clear. Selenese is committed to preserving the environment and helping our customers do the same thing. We want to work with you cooperatively as this bill moves through legislation through the legislative process to address these issues. Uh, because right now we cannot enter a carbon constrained world without the help of chemistry, without the help of polymers, because you won't have electric vehicles, energy efficient buildings, wind turbines, those are all needed. So we do look forward to working with you together. Stephanie, thank you so much for uh, those remarks. Derek, thank you so much as well. Um, I'm gonna now bring in uh, Laura Chamorro, who is the general manager of uh, Shell Polymers. Laura, why don't you take it from here and tell us a little bit about what you've got going? Sure, thank you for that introduction, Joshua. 
While the Shell brand is well known globally, you may not know that Shell makes chemicals that support modern life, sustainable living, and will enable the energy transition. We supply materials and thousands of products that we all use every day, including hygiene, medical, and personal care products, which have been critical for fighting COVID-19, but also furniture, appliances, packaging, and construction materials, just to name a few. As we continue into a more sustainable future, many of the finished products made from petrochemicals routinely use less resources and have a lower carbon footprint than alternative materials. Plastics provide more efficient insulation, lighter weight cars and planes, and are key components in wind turbines and solar panels. These products are imperative components of the modern American lifestyle for health, safety, comfort, convenience, and enabling the transition to cleaner energy. Shell is currently building a new state-of-the-art facility in Western Pennsylvania to expand participation in those markets, which would be put at risk by this legislation. This new facility in Manaka, Pennsylvania is an enormous investment in US manufacturing, which is not only helping to revitalize a previously depressed region and labor market, but also leverages our domestic manufacturing and trade advantage globally. The complex currently employs over 8,000 unionized trade workers who are constructing the facility, and we expect about 600 permanent employees once complete. In constant pursuit of balancing growth, consumer demands, and a sustainable future, we've established some ambitious sustainability goals. In 2019, we announced a goal to recycle a million metric tons of plastic waste per year in our global chemical plants by 2025. Achieving that ambition could enable Shell to offset nearly two thirds of the intended production of our new facility. Also in 2019, Shell entered into a supply agreement with Nexus, a waste plastics to chemicals feedstock processor, who is regularly supplying us on average nearly 500 metric tons per year of pyrolysis feedstock to our Louisiana facilities. They're currently working to triple that supply, which has been directly enabled by commitments with Shell and others in the industry. Advanced recycling is one of the most effective technologies we have to progress circularity in plastics. One of the key benefits of advanced recycling is the ability to process waste plastics for which there aren't other economic or technically feasible solutions for reuse like traditional recycling. Products which are critical for food preservation, medical, health, and hygiene are often difficult to separate and process due to size or contamination. As a result, they're unsuitable for traditional recycling streams and are landfilled instead. Similarly, these applications are sufficiently sensitive to quality and sterility such that mechanically recycled uh, materials are not suitable for feedstock for their manufacture but recycled, uh, advanced recycled feedstocks are. Promoting circularity through advanced recycling while protecting the integrity and efficacy of these materials should be our collective priority. So in summary, the, the passage of this pause legislation would be destructive in several ways. The first is the outcome would be disastrous for our manufacturing communities resulting in the loss of direct and indirect jobs and local tax revenue. The second is that the passage of such legislation would halt further manufacturing investment, which would otherwise bring economic growth, technical innovation, including sustainability advancements, and hinder growth of high-tech manufacturing jobs, which will enable energy transition. Next is the United States' ability to leverage our global trade advantage. The petrochemical industry is uniquely positioned for competing globally with domestically manufactured products, and this legislation threatens that position of strength in global trade. And finally, access to products essential to society and the American standard of living. That includes what's needed to fight our toughest challenges such as pandemic and natural disaster. So in closing, a pause is not progress for solving our toughest problems with plastic waste, reduction of our collective environmental impact energy transition or securing the availability of products necessary for protecting human life and maintaining our standard of living. Thank you for uh, listening. And with that, I'll hand it back to Joshua. Laura, thanks thanks so much for doing that. And thank you for those remarks. And thank you for the investments you guys are making in Pennsylvania. 
Um, just really quickly before we get to the next speaker, if you do have a question, please make sure you plug it into the Q&A function. We'll get to those in just one second. Uh, but without further ado, I want to introduce our next speaker, uh, Haley Lowry. Uh, Haley, please take it away. Hi, good morning, everyone. Uh, thanks so much uh, for joining today. It's really great to be here with you. Um, and as, as Dow's uh, Sustainability Director, um, which is a, a leading material science company headquartered in uh, Michigan, I can tell you that the industry is working extremely hard to stop plastic waste and to build circular systems where old plastic can be kept out of the environment and remanufactured into new plastic instead of going to a landfill or to incineration. And so that's why Dow has set ambitious targets to stop the waste, to close the loop, and also to protect the climate. So first, a circular economy for plastics allows us to retain the value and the benefits that plastic provides. Plastic allows us to do more with less material, resulting in significantly lower greenhouse gas emissions, and um, to explain this a little bit, there was a, a firm a few years ago called True Cost, and they um, are a leading firm in the industry. They calculate environmental impacts of two different types of you know, uh, options. And they uh, did a study on different types of materials, and they found that if you switch from plastic back to traditional materials, you're going to have a 3x increase in your CO2 footprint, which uh, Joshua also mentioned at the beginning of this too. And, but when people think about plastic, they also, they, they don't think about this or they don't even think about wind turbines, fuel efficient vehicles, the role that packaging plays in keeping food safe or vaccines to be delivered. People are thinking about straws and turtles noses. They're thinking about waste filled oceans and they're thinking about the poster child for society's addiction to convenience. And yes, we all agree too much waste is ending up in the environment and that's totally unacceptable. Um, we must solve these environmental challenges moving from take, make, dispose models, which are linear models to circular models because plastic is too valuable to be lost as waste. So my point is that we cannot burden shift. Um, we need to have a thoughtful, comprehensive and strategic approach. And with that, we can eliminate waste while keeping uh, our products fresh, while finding new models to infinitely recycle uh, and keep all materials in use. And that's absolutely where we need government's help. Secondly, we're seeing a huge shift in demand for recyclable and uh, recycled plastics, higher than ever before. Over 400 global brands have made commitments to 100% of their packaging to be recyclable by 2025 and to use 25 to 50% rec recycled content in their packaging moving forward. So demand is there and the marketplace is asking uh, for, for these changes in materials. We work with our customers to design for better recyclability. We offer products made with recycled content and we're innovating to quickly scale and expand advanced recycling, which Laura talked about, um, that can uh, really recycle more material while increasing that quality of the recycled material. Um, and unfortunately, these innovations are prohibited in the legislation. So in my global role, I see progress in Europe and growth around the world in the, era, in the area of recyclability and recycling. And it's, so it's important to note that to solve these system changes that we're talking about, both traditional recycling, which is what we have today with improvements, of course, and advanced recycling technologies are critical. We want to ensure that all plastics are recycled, not just some plastic. And advanced recycling in the US is also real. It's happening right now in states like Georgia, Indiana, North Carolina, Ohio, Oregon, Tennessee, Texas. And we need policies that accelerate, not pause on these recycling innovations. We will not be able to meet our ambition for the circular economy if the provisions in this bill are adopted. So the bottom line is that our focus is to look to deliver products and solutions that enable a more circular economy, strengthening lower carbon infrastructure and reinforcing our critical manufacturing capacity. And we would love the opportunity to work with you on solutions to end waste, to address climate um, change and policies that enable circularity for all materials. Thank you so much. And I look forward to more of a discussion at the Q&A portion. Haley, thank you so much for those great remarks. Uh, before we go to our last speaker, 
Um, just a reminder, we'd love to take some questions. Uh, the chat function is available. Um, after Michael's remarks, uh, we'll open it up for some Q&A, so don't be shy. Uh, with that, Michael, um, I want to welcome you. And before we get going, I want to apologize because I know we had a prep session and I totally butchered your name at the beginning. So I know how to say it. <laughs> That's thank quite you. all right. Thank you so Not much uh, for um, being on board and thank you for uh, making some remarks. So please. Not at all. Thank you, everybody, for participating this morning. My name is Michael Moreno and I'm the co founder and chief operating officer of Brave and Environmental, a 10 year plus year old company focused on using pyrolysis for the conversion of hard to recycle plastics into products used by the petrochemical companies as an input in the production of new plastics, partially substituting traditional crude raw materials with our product. What do we actually do? We're taking bales of plastics that would normally be dumped into landfills. We shred them. We heat them in the absence of oxygen. So this is not combustion. And as they heat, they eventually vaporize. We take those vapors, we condense them back into their liquid form and again, we sell them to petrochemical companies to use it as a substitute in order to make new plastics and therefore cementing their position in the circular economy as it results, as it relates to plastics. So what we're doing is we're using a safe proven science. Other things that I wanna point out is that we are privately owned and funded. We have not received public funds since the inception of the company. And we came about because we wanted to solve the world's waste plastics problem. In other words, doing good while doing well. I wanna also address two arguments made by those that are proposing legislation to curtail the installation of our technology. Um, one is that it doesn't work, people. I hear this all the time. Well, it doesn't work, it's not proven and it's not economically viable. Well, I'm here to say that it does work and it does and is economically viable. The company itself was funded by myself, my partner and friends and family since inception in 2010 to 2017. And in 2017 through present day, we've been, we've been funded by sophisticated investors focused on ESG investing that see our technology and the sector as a whole as an important part of the solutions being established to help the environment. We have to be permitted in order to build a facility. We actually did that in Yonkers, New York, where we built, tested and ran a full size first generation machine in Yonkers, New York. I'm from New York. We built and tested and ran a full size second generation machine also in Yonkers, New York, which was then moved to North Carolina, where we're operating today. We operate a commercial facility in Zebulon, North Carolina, supplying our products to petrochemical companies to use to make new plastics. The installation of our technology required an array of permits and a stringent process that focused specifically on safety and emissions. As a matter of fact, the facility required a special use permit that was granted after much due diligence work by a number of municipal departments, specifically addressing emissions and safety. We had to have a public hearing where we had to answer questions from community members and parents of children attending an elementary school literally up the street from our facility. We had to receive building department permits fire department review, and we have to follow state emissions regulations, stringent state emissions regulations, which are tested on a regular basis. We, by the way, have been classified as a minor use source of emissions, similar to a company making widgets down the street. In Virginia, we plan on building a second facility. It was announced by the governor of Virginia last year, and we plan on breaking ground in June. And they are, quite frankly, welcoming us, welcoming us with open arms because we are bringing real jobs. We're redirecting plastics away from landfills and we're continuing to advance our technology to make it even easier to deploy and more efficient to run. Our business plan is to continue to develop facilities throughout the US, starting with those states that have passed paralysis friendly legislation. There are 10 on the books right now. Our mission as a company is by 2030 to have enough Braven facilities around the world to redirect and process at least half of the waste plastics away from our landfills and waterways. And our purpose is to solve the world's waste plastics crisis. We do not understand how legislation such as this can be interpreted as anything other than a direct blocking of a viable, proven and safe solution to the waste plastics problem available today. I myself am a surfer. I like being in the water. I wanna solve this problem. And I think that this is the type of legislation that is an affront to the advancement and development of our technology. The last thing I want to say is that we would welcome you to visit our facility, come and see it at work, either live or virtually at any point in time. And you can see that this is indeed a solution that's available today. 
and one that should not be prevented from being deployed on a national and eventually a global scale. And again, I welcome any questions during the Q&A. And again, thank you for your time uh, this morning. Michael, thank you so much for those uh, uh, remarks and thank you for um, bringing to life some of this. Maybe we could get all of the panelists actually on camera.